When you first look at a teaching like dependent co-arising, it seems very abstract and very far away from what anything you might be doing in the practice. But if you look at it more carefully, you see that it makes a whole series of important statements. One, you notice when the Buddha talks about the causes of suffering, he doesn't trace it back to what you are. He doesn't say you suffer because you're basically bad, or that you suffer because you're basically good, but somehow you've been socially conditioned to forget your true inner goodness. It comes back instead to what you do. And that right there is quite a radical statement, because you can change your actions. Simply through knowledge, understanding what things you do are going to cause suffering, what states of mind lead to suffering. You, look, you can look for those and you can change them. And to the extent the Buddha does talk about what you are, it's way along the path, or dependent arising, way up there in what's called bhava, or states of being. It's not a question of what you inherently are, or good or bad, simply your being comes about from what you do. That's the reverse of the way most of us think. Most of us think we are a certain way, our basic nature is a certain way, and that we're going to act because of our basic nature. He says instead that what you are, in the sense of whether you identify yourself on the sensual level or on the level of form or formless level, you can trace it back to what you do. Then again, you can learn to do things in a more skillful way so that your sense of what you are will change and will be less and less likely to cause suffering. This is why his teaching is a training, because the kind of ignorance that leads to wrong actions, again, is not an ignorance of what you are. It's simply an ignorance of the principles of what kind of actions work for true happiness and which kinds of actions don't. That's what the Four Noble Truths come down to. In each of these knowledges in the Four Noble Truths deals with a task that you develop as a skill. That makes another important statement. If the kind of ignorance that was a problem was simply whether you knew your true nature or not, it would be an all-or-nothing sort of thing. But skills can be developed gradually. Your sensitivity develops, your, your dexterity at shaping things more skillfully, more appropriately. That develops over time. So it is a gradual path. It's a gradual training. So it's in this way that the, the teachings are directly connected to what we're doing right now. You're focusing on your breath. You're directing your thoughts and you're evaluating your breath. You use certain perceptions and certain feelings <coughs> result. These are all elements in the factor of fabrication, which comes right after ignorance. We breathe ignorantly. We perceive things through ignorance. Our thoughts about things, discursive thinking, the way we evaluate things, in other words, the mind's use of language, generally is done with ignorance, and so as a result we suffer. But if you bring knowledge to these processes, they can actually become a healing kind of fabrication. After all, the path is a path of fabrication. The Buddha isn't telling you just to drop any activity at all and be totally passive or totally without any kind of intention. We hear that the, the goal at the end of the path is to be free from fabrication, so I think we'll just stop fabricating. But the mind doesn't do that. The intention to stop fabricating is an intention. 
and you can get very much attached to that kind of passivity, and it doesn't help anything at all. So we bring more and more knowledge to the process of breathing and how we use our thoughts. And sometimes you hear that our thinking, which is based a lot on language, is our, the reason why we're suffering. We picked up these bad social influences, taught us to think in dualistic terms or whatever. But again, that's not the Buddha's approach. He says, if you use language in ignorance, you're going to suffer. But the problem is not with language. I was talking to a Hindu monk a while back. He was saying he was responding to someone who had came up to him and said, how can we get beyond duality? And his response was, what's wrong with duality? You're talking to me, aren't you? Language is going to involve making distinctions. If we couldn't make distinctions, what would our language be like? It would be like the kind of stuff when they speak in tongues, Pentecostal church, blah, who knows what it means. It doesn't mean anything or everything, which is totally useless language. The mind has to make distinctions, and distinctions are not—we feel distinctions, we have a sense of right and wrong, not because we're taught them by society. It becomes innate. This goes deeper to our, our sense of feeling and perception, the mental fabrications that are often pre-linguistic. Deep down inside, we know that anything that threatens our existence is bad. Anything that helps it is good. Even lizards know this much, and that's why it's embedded in the lizard brain. Very strong sense of right and wrong. The hatred of pain, the love of pleasure. The ability to perceive an enemy, to perceive an escape from an enemy. These are really basic to the mind, much prior to any kind of social conditioning. And the social conditioning is actually needed to mitigate some of those immediate fears, immediate judgments. So instead of throwing out language or throwing out our social conditioning, we learn how to use it more skillfully. And working with the breath is an ideal place to start. You're giving space to the mind by breathing in a way that feels good. And you can use your linguistic habits to talk to yourself about the breath. How does this breath feel? How does that breath feel? Where would it feel good to breathe right now? Which part of the body needs good breath energy? And this way you get more and more in touch with the immediate feeling of your body, so that your linguistic habits are showing an immediate benefit. It feels good to breathe this way. It feels good to breathe that way. Your mind and your body are getting more together. So that all the levels of fabrication, the physical, the verbal, and the mental, start working together around a common sense of well-being. This way they get to communicate with each other. The process of breathing, focusing on the breath and breath meditation in a skillful way is really a healing process. Each time you sit down to meditate, don't think of it as a chore. Think of it as an opportunity to do some more healing work. And don't think of it as a time when you're obliged to stop thinking. In the beginning, you have to use your directed thought and evaluation to get things to settle down, to adjust things, to get everybody together. And when everyone's together like this, interesting things come up. Hidden feelings, hidden perceptions suddenly show themselves, and you can work through them. It's almost like dealing with a person who's possessed. The possessed person, from the point of view of Western psychology, is a schizophrenic. They're two different personalities in the one person. From a more traditional perspective, there really are two different people in there. But the thing is that they're not cooperating. That's the big problem. They're working at cross purposes. And for many of us, they're Directed thoughts and evaluations are working at one purpose. 
the way we feel and our different perceptions can be going in all sorts of different directions. And what we're doing here as we work with the breaths is to give a place for all the different parts of the mind, all the different members of the committee, all the different levels of sensation and activity going on, to learn how to be with each other in a peaceful spot. You're showing goodwill for one another because you're cooperating. And that way interesting things come up and you can deal with them. You can learn new habits of how you relate to your body, new habits in how you think, how you frame an issue in the mind and how you work through the difficulties and whatever it is going on. When you learn how to deal with yourself in a healthier way like this, it's also a lot easier then to start dealing in a healthy way with other people, too. So the breath meditation not only helps you, it helps everybody else you live with, because it gives you paradigms. For one thing, it gives you immediate training in how to employ the, the Brahma Viharas, the sublime attitudes of limitless goodwill, limitless compassion, limitless empathetic joy, limitless equanimity. In other words, you have goodwill for yourself in allowing yourself to breathe in a comfortable way. When you see that your breathing is uncomfortable, or that the way you think is causing dis-ease in the body or the mind, you have compassion for yourself. It's trying to figure out some way to do this in a better way. When it's going well, you don't start feeding on ideas, well, I'm not worthy of this, I really shouldn't allow myself to feel good, this good. You try to maintain that sense of well-being. Let the ideas of deserving and not deserving just go by the boards. Again, those are usually based on an idea of what you are deep down inside, or somehow that you have to be punished for things you did in the past. And that's not how the Buddhist teachings work. Different actions will inevitably lead to different effects. There doesn't have to be anybody up there to, deserve, to decide who deserves what. So if you're able to maintain a sense of well-being, well, keep at it. Because if you're operating from a sense of well-being that's stable, you're going to start acting in more skillful ways all around. And there's equanimity for the things that you can't change. The habits you aren't able fully, the bad habits you aren't able to fully eradicate, or the problems that come in from past karma that you can't change. The purpose of equanimity, though, is to keep you focused on the things you can change. So here, as you work with the breath in a skillful way, it gives you some training in what are essentially social virtues, Brahma-viharas. Then you can apply the same lessons to your dealings with people around you. Instead of being a process of lobotomizing the mind so that you don't think, meditation is learning how to teach you how to think in more skillful ways, how to act in more skillful ways with knowledge, with an understanding of actions and their results, and particularly the types of activities in the mind that would lead a particular situation to bring suffering or not to bring suffering. So the question of who you are gets put aside. The question of who you've been gets put aside. You can focus purely on what you're doing and what can you do to train yourself to be more sensitive and more effective in bringing about an end of suffering and activities that lead more and more to true happiness. So it's not what you are, it's what you do. And if what you do is not skillful, you can learn to make it skillful with each breath. Those are some of the lessons that you can derive from the, what seems like a very abstract teaching on Dependent Core Rising. It is abstract. It's put out as a list. It's a very convoluted list. And as the Buddha himself admitted, it's not simple. It's like the, a tangled bird's nest, he said at one point. But you can pull out a few strands pull out a few of the twigs, and you find that they really are helpful in putting an end to suffering, teaching you how to 
think and act and even breathe in ways that can lead to the end of suffering.